Hi, and thank you for watching this video. I wanted to do a follow-up on the previous video regarding the resurrection of the dead, after digging a little deeper into the matter, and after a fellow brother in Christ, William Fay, pointed out the actual Greek and Hebrew translations of what is said in Daniel 12 and John 5. Thank you for pointing this out, William. Let's quickly look again at what is written in these passages, and then at what the Greek and Hebrew words mean, and what this could be alluding to. And at that time shall Michael stand up the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt." And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars for ever and ever. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. What I would like to show you are the direct translations for shame and everlasting contempt in Daniel and the resurrection of damnation as given in the King James Version as we see written in John chapter 5. When using interlinear scripture analyzer we can get a better idea of the actual meaning of the original Hebrew and Greek words for these phrases as well as the direct translation from the original languages. In Daniel, the translation of shame and contempt is given as reproach and repulsion, which I would say is a close match for what we read in the KGV. But when we go to John chapter 5, the translation of damnation is given as the resurrection of judging or judgment, which gives a somewhat different understanding to what we get from the word damnation. However, when we understand that the resurrection of those who died without Christ will be one of judging or judgment, this passage links to several other passages in the Word of God that further elaborate on this event, and more specifically, the judgment of the dead. Now before we look at a little more detail regarding the judgment of the dead, I would like to acknowledge that this subject is upsetting for some and could be seen as very controversial to others, and I believe the reason for most of us not seeing or realizing this up to now can be attributed to how we have approached the Word of God. Traditionally, the way in which the Word of God is studied would in most instances involve a predominantly chronological approach to what was written and as such most view the resurrection of the dead only occurring at the end of the millennial reign of Christ, where most will also position the white throne judgment. This is done, in my opinion, because the white throne judgment is described after the description of Satan being cast into the lake of fire, which happens at the end of the millennium, and therefore most would consider the judgment of the dead to follow Satan being cast into the lake of fire, and therefore not really relevant for the time that we find ourselves in now. However, when we approach the Word of God from the perspective of piecing together passages about a subject for which information may be scattered throughout the 67 books of the Bible, and assemble the information as one would do with pieces of a puzzle, we obtain a somewhat different understanding. If for a moment we abandon the traditional chronological approach, with our only intent being that of obtaining an understanding that, as far as possible, avoids any contradiction with other passages regarding the same subject, we get a somewhat different understanding of when these events will occur. I believe that the puzzle approach also allows us to get closer to the truth, given that we reject viewpoints that would contradict passages in the Word of God and that will allow us to only focus on obtaining an understanding that harmonizes all passages about a specific subject, thus leading us closer to the truth. I know my approach in studying God's Word may not seem conventional, but to me the truth is what is most important, and that is why I value every word that is written in this incredible book. My only desire is to reach an understanding that avoids any contradiction with any part of Scripture. 
I would like to show you an example of how information provided in the Bible does not necessarily follow a chronological sequence, and when we assume that it does, it could lead to an incorrect understanding of what is written. It just so happens that this example also concerns the resurrection of the dead, which makes this even more important to understand. Please consider the following passage. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Now when the centurion, and they that were with him watching Jesus, saw the earthquake, and those things that were done, they feared greatly, saying, Truly this was the Son of God. When we consider this passage purely from a chronological perspective, it would seem that the dead arose at the time when the earthquake occurred that tore the veil of the temple into two. And many people hold to this view because they approach the word with their focus on the sequence in which information is provided, and without looking at whether the information provided lines up with what else is said in the Word of God about the subject. We have to take into account that the highlighted section would cause a contradiction in the chronology with what is also stated in the same passage, and this has to do with Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection. The dead mentioned in this passage only arose and came out of their graves after Jesus' resurrection, which occurred three days after his crucifixion. So from a chronological perspective, the highlighted section is out of sequence and did not occur for another three days. When we read the very next sentence, we are back at the time of the crucifixion, and it is easy to see why people would think that the dead came out of their graves while Jesus hung on the cross. And this is because the primary focus is on the chronology with which information was written. It is therefore important to understand that everything in the Word of God is not given to us in a chronological order, and we have to piece it together with the help of other passages from the Word in order to obtain an understanding that matches everything that was written about a subject. If we encounter an apparent contradiction between our understanding and a passage about a subject in God's Word, we need to adjust our understanding to harmonize that scripture with the rest of the passages concerning that subject. Only when we have an understanding that does not contradict any passages about the subject could we begin to say that we have understanding. It is interesting that this passage in the book of Matthew contains a section about the raising of the dead that does not fit in with the chronology of the story. Because the same is true when we consider the next instance in which the dead will be raised. What I would like to look at next is the timing involved with the resurrection of the main harvest that concerns people who have died in Christ and some who will be alive at the time when it occurs. I would like to focus specifically on those who died without Christ and who will be raised for judgment with those who will receive everlasting life. As I have stated earlier, the traditional view regarding the judgment of the dead positions this event at the end of the millennial reign. So let's see what the Word of God shows us with regards to the timing when we piece together passages regarding this event. Let's start off by considering the following four passages. Therefore I will shake the heavens, and the earth shall remove out of her place, and the wrath of the Lord of hosts, and in the day of his fierce anger. Saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to him. For the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks of the mountains, 
and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? I think you will agree with me that the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls, described in the book of Revelation, concern God's fierce anger and the hour of His judgment which is directly mentioned in Revelation 14 and that these events form part of the tribulation that will come over the earth. It is also clear to see from these passages that judgment and wrath is associated with the return of Jesus at His second coming, specifically pointed out to us in Revelation 6 and 19. We also have to consider what we are told about the millennial reign and that Jesus will be on the earth ruling with a rod of iron and that everyone on the earth at that time will know that Jesus is God. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. Now, I want you for a moment to consider the living conditions on the earth, especially during the second half of the tribulation, where the remnant of Israel will require God's supernatural protection in the wilderness in order to remain alive and to make it through under the conditions that can be expected during this time, as seen described in the following two passages. Moreover, the light of the moon shall be as the light of the sun, and the light of the sun shall be sevenfold as the light of seven days, in the day that the Lord bindeth up the breach of his people, and healeth the stroke of their wound. And except that the Lord had shortened those days, no flesh should be saved. But for the elect's sake, whom he hath chosen, he hath shortened the days. If a day on earth received seven times the sunlight it normally does, you can imagine the temperatures that would be reached and that without God's protection people would be burned to death and that this will be part of what God will protect Israel's remnant from. Also, imagine the situation as far as destruction that will occur on the earth during this period is concerned. Specifically, the release of radioactivity into the environment when we consider that at least three major asteroid impacts will occur during the time of the tribulation. In Japan we saw how a relatively small tsunami led to irreversible contamination of the Pacific Ocean which continues to this day and if allowed a little more time this event alone will be responsible for destroying life in the oceans of the world. Now imagine the impact of several asteroids colliding with the earth in rapid succession. A large asteroid impact in an ocean will result in all coastal nuclear power plants to follow in the footsteps of Fukushima, with massive tsunamis that will be much larger and much more destructive than the one encountered at Fukushima. This is the picture that the Word of God paints for us coming about as a result of the judgments that will be carried out over the earth and the wicked that will inhabit the world at that time. For those who plan to stand strong during the tribulation and who are prepping for this time, please consider the fact that an environment that will be saturated with radioactivity will kill any prepper in a slow and agonizing death. And on top of that, the temperature of the air that people will breathe will be so hot that it will fry a person's lungs. There are many things one can prepare for, but when life's essentials are no longer available, all the prepping in the world will be in vain. We have to ask then, what happens to the earth at the end of this time of judgment, when the remnant of Israel reaches the end of their protection in the wilderness, and when God had saved some flesh to inhabit the millennium? In light of what we read in the following passage, and keeping in mind that we want to reach an understanding in which we avoid any contradiction between our understanding in what is written, would the word of God support the current earth's restoration at the end of God pouring his judgment and wrath out over the earth? The earth is utterly broken down, the earth is clean dissolved, the earth is moved exceedingly. 
the earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard, and shall be removed like a cottage, and the transgression thereof shall be heavy upon it, and it shall fall and not rise again. This passage from Isaiah 24 clearly shows us that once the current earth is judged, which happens during the day of God's fierce anger, and therefore during the tribulation, that there is no restoration intended for the earth after that point. This is very important. Also note that this passage tells us that the transgressions of the earth will be heavy upon it, and that once it has fallen it will not be restored. Now, if you believe that our Heavenly Father will restore this earth once He judged it, you have to accept that such a viewpoint contradicts what the Word shows us in Isaiah 24. The next question to ask then is, how do we move from a situation in which God's protection over Israel is required to keep them alive, to a situation in which Israel thrives during the millennial reign of Christ, also taking into account what was said about the earth in Isaiah 24. Once again we have to scrutinize the traditional belief that the new heavens and the new earth are created at the end of the millennium, given that the description of God's replacement of His creation is mentioned in Revelation 21, after the description of the millennial reign. And once again, this understanding has come about as a result of the chronology with which information was recorded in the book of Revelation. There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die an hundred years old, but the sinner being an hundred years old shall be accursed. In this passage we see that mortal people who have lived for a century would be considered children. And this is certainly not something one would associate with a world that is highly radioactive, and where the heat is seven times that which we are currently used to. The answer to this question, in my opinion, which also resolves this apparent contradiction with Isaiah 24, comes clearly in what precedes this verse in Isaiah 65, where we read the following. For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth and the former shall not be remembered, nor come to mind. But be ye glad and rejoice for ever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and joy in my people, and the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. The only conclusion in which Isaiah 24 and Isaiah 65 can be true at the same time requires us to position the creation of the new earth and the new heavens at the end of the tribulation. If we are of the opinion that the new heavens and the new earth are only created at the end of the millennium, then we would have to violate God's word to bring about a habitat for people to survive in not to mention the fact that the word shows us that the conditions on the earth during the millennium will even go beyond what we are currently used to. If God restored the present earth after he judged it at his second coming, we are implying that God would break his own word in order to provide that habitat that would not require his protection for mortal people. I believe Isaiah 24 specifically tells us that the present earth will not be restored after its judgment during the tribulation, so that we can discover when the new earth will be created, not based on the chronology with which information was recorded in the word of God, but through careful study and piecing the puzzle together correctly. Positioning the new heavens and the new earth at the start of the millennium leads to no contradiction between passages regarding the subject, as far as I can see. And we also see the following then connected to these events. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Do you see what this passage shows us? The great white throne could have been associated with any other aspect that we find in the Word of God, but in this passage we see that it is specifically associated with the destruction of the current heavens and earth. Now, what would be the reason for this association? In my opinion, 
It shows us that the great white throne judgment does not occur at the end of the millennium as traditionally understood through a chronological belief, but it happens at the second coming of Christ. And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captains and the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Even in Revelation 6, we see further confirmation for this understanding, as those who try to hide from their judgment flee from him that sits on the throne. And what throne would that be? It can only be the great white throne. There is more evidence from the word that shows us that the dead will be judged at the second coming of Christ, which happens before the millennial reign, if we are careful in avoiding contradiction. Once again we have to keep in mind that the Bible shows us in several places how all that are dead and that are in the graves will be resurrected when they hear the voice of God and all of what follows are related to the passages in which Paul describes in a little more detail what Jesus was referring to in John chapter 5. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 has a number of different qualities to what we read in Revelation 20, where the resurrection of those who were all murdered for refusing to worship the Antichrist and for refusing to accept the mark of the beast in their bodies are described. And I believe it is very important to understand these differences. I have done a number of videos in which I discuss these differences between these resurrection events and how they form part of a harvest cycle as described to us in the Old Testament. And I would urge you to watch some of these videos if you have not done so already in the little time that remains. Taking into account the models of the harvest and the temple, the resurrection event described by Paul occurs at the start of the tribulation, when those who died in Christ will be resurrected, and those who are alive at the time, who rely completely on what Jesus did for them to obtain their salvation, will be changed and will meet the Lord in the air, together with those who died in Christ and who were resurrected. They are then taken to the places prepared for them by the bridegroom, as described in John chapter 14. Let not your heart be troubled, Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Note that Jesus' description in this passage tells us that he receives us unto himself, and then takes us to the place that he had prepared, which is clearly not on the earth, since Jesus told his disciples that he goes away to prepare a place, and that we will accompany him there once he receives us unto himself. Jesus did not prepare a place for us here on earth, since he is not here, so we can know that the places prepared for us are in heaven, where we will remain while God's judgment and wrath is executed over the earth, before we accompany him returning to the earth at his second coming. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood, and shall no more cover her slain. And Enoch also the seventh from Adam prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints, to execute judgment upon all, 
and to convince all that are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have ungodly committed, and of all their hard speeches which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. Also, given Jesus' introduction of John chapter 14, it would be very difficult to have anybody without troubled hearts if those that Jesus referred to here had to endure any portion of the tribulation, sharing the world with the dead that were resurrected to judgment, and awaiting beheading for their faith in Jesus and for refusing to worship the Antichrist. Such prospects would certainly not lead to hearts that are not troubled. This passage is also tied to Titus 2 verse 13 and 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 18, where we read about the hope and the comfort which will not be available to those who will endure the tribulation. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore comfort one another with these words looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. These are words of comfort and love, and they are void of judgment, showing us when Jesus will receive us unto himself. When the resurrection that Paul describes occurs, we know that it is this event that involves the shout or the voice of God, and that this is linked to what Jesus described in John chapter 5 telling us that at the time when the voice of God speaks to the dead to raise them up, that all who are dead will come out of the graves, some to everlasting life, who will be hidden in the chambers that Jesus prepared for them, and those who are resurrected for judgment that will remain on the earth to receive God's judgment for their sins, which were not covered by His blood. It is astonishing to realize that people who died without Christ before the start of the tribulation will be resurrected at the start of the tribulation to experience all of it right from the start. Also note how Isaiah 26 verse 21 points out the fact that the earth shall at this point no longer cover her slain, and that it is associated with the timing of God's people entering into their chambers that He prepared for them. Now the Bible also tells us that there will be degrees of punishment and that sin will not be imputed where there was no law. And we have to keep this in mind when we consider the judgment of the dead. For until the law sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Only through being born again of God's Spirit can one completely avoid God's judgment. And only those who accepted His free gift of salvation through faith will obtain this privilege. The Bible also shows us in Hebrews 11 that several people who lived before the age of grace obtained God's grace through faith in the Lamb of God that had yet to come at that time all the way from Adam's time, showing us that God does not change. Now please consider the following passage. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged and that thou shouldst give reward unto thy servants the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name small and great, and shouldst destroy them which destroy the earth. Notice how this passage specifically talks about the time of the dead, and that they should be judged, and that this forms part of God's wrath, which is executed during the tribulation. This passage is once again associated with the destruction of the earth, requiring us to keep Isaiah 24 verse 20 in mind when we read it, and that this has to occur before the start of the millennial reign. This passage once again gives us the application and timing of the judgment that Jesus spoke of in John 5, and tells us that those who are resurrected for God's judgment will already be walking on the earth during the first half of the tribulation. See how the following passage emphasizes this. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. This passage is once again associated with John 5 and 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, where the events associated with the resurrection of the dead are described. 
From what we considered so far, have you seen any biblical evidence that would support the dead being judged at the end of Jesus' millennial reign? Several of the passages that we have considered clearly state that the judgment of the dead occurs at Jesus' second coming, and there is no mention of this happening at the end of the millennium. The only reason why most people position this judgment at the end of the millennial reign is because of where this information is found in the word of God. It is mentioned after Satan is cast into the lake of fire, but just as in the example of the dead that came out of their graves, forming part of the crucifixion narrative, we have to position the information correctly and not rely only on the chronology with which information was written. We also know that the final portion of the first resurrection, or the gleanings of the faith harvest, whose resurrection is described in Revelation 20, are given judgment and that they will take part in the judgment that will be executed over the dead. The Bible gives us further confirmation and an important quality of the new earth, which will, as I have already shown, be required to exist at the start of the millennium, if we want to avoid contradiction with Isaiah 24. And this is what is said. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. The new earth will have no sea, and positioning the creation of the new earth and new heavens at the start of the millennium, we see another indicator of timing for the judgment of the dead in the following passage, where the current earth will deliver up its dead. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. If the judgment of the dead occurred at the end of the millennium, that view would not only contradict Isaiah 24 verse 20, which will require God to break His word and to restore the present earth to create a habitat far better than the one we live in today, but it would also contradict what we read in Revelation 20, since there would be no sea on the earth at the end of the millennium that could give up the dead. The new earth will have no sea from which the dead could be delivered up. Remember that if we keep Isaiah 14 verse 9 in mind and harmonize scripture, all of these judgment events occur at Jesus' second coming. Those who are called the dead will be resurrected to repulsion and reproach, as they did not receive salvation through faith in Jesus, and they will be judged based on their works alone. This judgment occurs shortly after Jesus' return to the earth, and after the third part of the barley harvest or the tribulation saints have been resurrected, to whom this judgment will also be entrusted, based on what we read in Revelation 20. And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Jesus' second coming is also linked to Israel's protection in the wilderness, which requires them to lay their eyes on their Messiah before they can call him their Lord and receive his protection, since they have no faith. This is a specific quality of the wheat harvest to which Israel belongs. It is a harvest that is completely void of faith. And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be, for they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. If our goal is to avoid contradiction between passages, Jesus' second coming then has to occur at the midpoint of the tribulation in order for Israel's blindness to be lifted and to see with their eyes who it is that extends his protection to them that will protect them for 1260 days in the wilderness and the fact that all three parts of the first resurrection have to be complete 
which is known as the fullness of the Gentiles, in order for Israel's blindness to be removed, and to be in a position to recognize their true Messiah through sight. This is the only timing for the second coming that allows all of these events to occur at the same time, without contradiction, and to harmonize the passages that describe these events from what I can see. Jesus then also tells us a little more about the judgment of the dead, or those who died without salvation through faith in Jesus. And once again, note the timing and the description in Jesus' own explanation regarding this judgment, when he will sit on the great white throne. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat, I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink, I was a stranger, and ye took me in, naked, and ye clothed me, I was sick, and ye visited me, I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee, and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger, and took thee in, or naked, and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick, or in prison, and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me no meat, I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in, naked, and ye clothed me not, sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these, ye did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. The sheep and the goat judgment is the same as the white throne judgment, and is carried out over those people who died without being saved through faith in Jesus. These events are once again associated with Jesus' second coming, and not with the end of his millennial reign, for which there is no solid scriptural support. The ramification of having the dead raised back to life at the start of the tribulation will certainly affect the way in which people view this period during which God will judge the earth and those that will be living on it at the time. I know that this is not a popular understanding of Scripture, but I believe that it is one that is aligned with what is written in the Word of God. So why am I sharing this with you? Well, I believe the Lord prompted me to do this after I felt that enough was said about the resurrection of the dead in the previous video. But that this is such an important topic as it will affect many believers during the tribulation who will enter into this period either desiring to go into the tribulation or discovering that there was a problem with what they believed and that it was not the truth. Many believe that those who belong to God are required to go through the tribulation to do the Lord's work and to prove themselves worthy through suffering when the word of God shows us that there is nothing whatsoever that we can do to prove ourselves worthy. All the glory for our salvation goes to Jesus alone, and if we believe that we can add to what He did for us on the cross through anything that we try to do at any time, and that this will count towards our salvation, then we soil our perfectly clean garments of Jesus' righteousness, and will have to wash them anew in the blood of the Lamb. 
The word also shows us that those with soiled garments will endure the tribulation. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. What does this tell us? These are people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God and who have received the robe of righteousness as a result. However, they then add their own works to what Jesus did to count towards their salvation, believing that Jesus' finished work on the cross was not quite enough to save them, and as a result they soil their garments with their own filthy righteousness. There are three interesting aspects I would like to conclude with, and the conclusion in itself may be somewhat lengthy. The first comes from the Epic of Gilgamesh, which is one of the oldest writings known to man. Now compared to the Word of God, this has absolutely no value to me, and I mention this only out of interest and because it would seem to line up with what is written in Isaiah 14 verse 9 considering that the oldest existing version of this story dates back to 2000 BC. Have a look at this short segment in which the following is stated. I shall smash the gates of the netherworlds right down to its dwelling. To the world below I shall grant manumission. I shall bring up the dead to consume the living. I shall make the dead outnumber the living. Imagine what life would be like if you had to fend for yourself in a world where the resurrected dead outnumbered the living, and where the dead will be consuming the living. Certainly a scenario that would be causing tribulation as never seen before on the earth, and most people would never even expect that this is what will soon happen. This also gives a new meaning to the phrase that Jesus used so often of the weeping and gnashing of teeth that people will experience who will enter the outer darkness. Secondly, Consider what this passage from Proverbs has to say. The man that wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. This clearly aligns with what we read in Revelation chapter 7 verse 14, pointing out those who have soiled their garments of Jesus' righteousness because they did not have the correct understanding and finding themselves in the congregation of the dead as a result. The reason why it is so important for me to avoid any contradiction between my understanding and the Word of God is because God's Word, not only in my view, but in our Heavenly Father's view, is more important than His name, and it is certainly the most precious possession one could have here on earth. I will worship toward Thy holy temple, and praise Thy name for Thy loving kindness and for Thy truth. For thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. If we blindly follow someone's teachings that clearly contradict multiple passages from God's word, then the truth is probably not that important to us, and what we believe may result in standing before the Lord with soiled garments of righteousness, or holding on to a belief which is simply not true. I believe this passage in Proverbs accentuates the importance of obtaining the correct understanding when it comes to the Word of God, and that we should not blindly believe something in our hearts which is not true, like the evil servant who suffered the consequences for holding on to a false belief in his heart. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Are you someone who believes that the Bible shows us that the Lord will delay His return for those that belong to Him until after the tribulation, and that there is no way in which He can return for us now? And are you criticizing fellow believers who hold to a different view than yours? Thirdly, the Skull and Bone Society, a secret organization at Yale University, has seen many of the presidents of the United States coming from it, 
And what is interesting is that their emblem is a skull and bones with the number 322 written underneath it. Many people have speculated what the meaning of this number could be, but I find it interesting that if this is supposed to be of significance, it could point to a very significant date this year. This year, March 22nd or 322, is the last day during which Israel will celebrate Purim, and during which Israel will encourage their people to experience pleasure. For this year, Israel has added an extra month to the Hebrew year, a practice that originated during their exile to Babylon, and moving the time during which they usually celebrate Passover out by a month. Could it be, in light of the following passage, that Israel may be adding an extra month to the wrong year, and would therefore be keeping their own feast as ordained in the book of Esther, when they are supposed to be keeping the Lord's Passover? The following two passages would seem to point such an error out, and note how this is also associated with a voice like a trumpet, which we see in Paul and Jesus' description of the resurrection of the dead. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness, and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice, they take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. And I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head and I will make it as the morning of an only sun, and the end thereof is a bitter day. Some in Israel have now called on President Trump to release his deal of the century before Israel's election on April 9th, saying that friends do not keep secrets from one another. This would certainly fit in with the understanding that a Purim fulfillment of 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 3 could be only days away, and that when they say peace and safety, that Israel's pleasure, which they experienced during Purim, could be turned into fear as described to us in Isaiah 21, as a result of Israel's friends betraying them and dividing up not only God's land but also Jerusalem. In this article by a Saudi reporter, we see that they apparently had insight into some of the details regarding Trump's peace plan, and in this case, it seems to be that Jerusalem will be part of what will be divided when President Trump finally announces his peace plan. And as he stated earlier, this will be done at a time that is right. A grievous vision is declared unto me. The treacherous dealer dealeth treacherously, and the spoiler spoileth. Go up, O Elam. Besiege, O media, all the signs thereof have I made to cease. Therefore are my loins filled with pain. Pangs have taken hold upon me as the pangs of a woman that travaileth. I was bowed down at the hearing of it. I was dismayed at the seeing of it. My heart panted. Fearfulness affrighted me. The night of my pleasure hath he turned into fear unto me. Also note how the next verse in this chapter calls princes to arise, and this is clearly connected to what we read in Isaiah 14 verse 9. Prepare the table, watch in the watchtower, eat, drink, arise ye princes, and anoint the shield. Who are these princes that will arise? They are described to us as the chief ones of the earth in Isaiah 14 verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up from their thrones all the kings of the nations. I know that for many this is not easy to take in, and I know many will also reject the information without searching the scriptures for themselves to establish whether this is really true or not. 
Because just as Israel, many have been conditioned to accept the traditions of men as the truth, above what we are shown in the word of God, which is supposed to be our source of truth. I am compelled to share this with you, because those who desire to enter or endure the tribulation have no idea of what awaits them. It is not our Heavenly Father's will to see any of those that belong to Him to suffer His judgment, and He has provided a way for us to escape. But the Word also shows us that many who believe that Jesus is the Son of God will enter the tribulation and will only realize their mistake once it is too late. These are called the foolish virgins and the evil servants in Jesus' parables. Many will also claim that these parables were not intended for believers in Jesus, and that I am not rightly dividing scripture, and once again I would have to respond by quoting Paul, who said that not only his own epistles, but that all scripture was inspired by God. Allow me to show you how it is impossible for the foolish virgins to represent people from Israel, and that the virgins are clearly shown to be people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God which is something that Israel is incapable of doing, and given the fact that they vehemently continue to reject Jesus as the Messiah at this time. I would like to point out the conversation between the bridegroom and the foolish virgins, and what was exchanged. Afterward came also the other virgins, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. You will note that the information provided in this conversation is very vague, especially when we consider this parable in isolation and when trying to discover the reason for Jesus telling the foolish virgins that he did not know them. However, we know that our Heavenly Father designed his word in a way that requires us to study all of it in order to obtain the correct understanding. And this conversation, specifically, is fully elaborated on only a few chapters earlier in the same gospel and this provides us with the missing detail this is what is written not every one that saith unto me lord lord shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my father which is in heaven many will say to me in that day lord lord have we not prophesied in thy name and in thy name have cast out devils and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Ask yourself this question. Is Israel currently prophesying in the name of Jesus, and are they casting out demons in the name of Jesus? These qualities are exclusively assigned to people that believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And this is confirmed for us in the book of Mark. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. When we combine the information from only these three passages, all coming from the Gospels, that were not written by Paul, they are clearly linked to each other, and they give us understanding of what is said in the parable of the ten virgins. And we realize that only people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God will have the ability to prophesy in his name and to cast out demons in the name of Jesus, and that the foolish virgins can therefore not represent Israel. If we assume then that the parable of the foolish virgins are only intended for Israel, can you see the contradictions one would have to overlook when considering what this is telling us? How would Israel be in a position to offer Jesus the fact that they have been prophesying and casting out demons in his name, at his coming, when they openly reject Jesus as being the Son of God, and according to God's word, they do not even have the capacity to believe in him through faith? And he said, I will hide my face from them. I will see what their end shall be. For they are a very froward generation, children in whom is no faith. Are you willing to blindly accept what people teach you, and by that I am also including myself, given that I am fallible and often make mistakes, which is part of what we have to deal with while we await our glorification? Or would you give God's word the prime position in your life as the only source of truth, 
and compare what people are saying to what is written in the Word of God. Keeping in mind that what we want to establish is an understanding that avoids contradiction with anything that is written in the Word of God. Even though I am fallible and make mistakes, I will always put my trust in God's Word first, no matter what any person or science or whatever other entities or institutions have to say, because God's Word is the only truth there is to know. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. I hope this information will bless you and also wake some people up to the reality of what could soon be in store for the earth if my understanding is correct, and I could be wrong. So what can you do to make sure that you are ready for our Savior when He returns to take us to the places that He prepared for us? Firstly, you have to believe that Jesus is the Son of God who took our sins upon Him and washed them away with His blood on the cross. The Bible tells us the following, That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the Scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Secondly, do not rely on anything that you can do to earn your own salvation. Our salvation is 100% attributed to what Jesus did on the cross for us. And if we believe that anything that we do can add to what Jesus did, or that it is required for us to finish what Jesus completed on the cross, we put ourselves in the shoes of the foolish virgins, who relied on their own wonderful works to earn them their salvation, in addition to believing that Jesus is the Son of God. Thirdly, do everything that you can to study the Word of God in order to obtain an understanding that does not contradict passages from the Word as far as possible. Search out the truth and do not blindly follow the teachings of people without verifying them against the Word of God. Also, do not believe in your heart like the evil servant did that Jesus will delay His coming. The Bible clearly states this belief as belonging to an evil servant, and therefore we have to expect him early. What do you have to lose by expecting our Lord early, and looking forward to seeing what He prepared for us while He was away? May our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you, and may He make His face shine upon you, and give you peace that transcends all understanding. Until we meet in the air, God bless.